Uh, homebrew recipe formulation. I'm gonna go over, uh, you know, what really is a beer recipe. Uh, we're gonna talk about guidelines for a little bit, but not too much. Um, and then references of where you can get started. Uh, I want to talk about software tools for recipe formulation. Um, and then also I want to get into ingredients, at least at a high level. I think we have to hit all four major ingredients to, and then some more advice. And then when we're done with all this, I actually, I think it might be nice to actually try to make a recipe as a crowd here. Yes. So we'll, we'll do that as well. All right. So anyone remember ProMesh? Who uses ProMesh still? Karen? She's Karen. Um, so a beer recipe is really a list of malts and a hopping. It's, it's more than, I think, a, a list of malts and hopping schedule. Um, you probably, and since I am a project manager in my daily life, I mean, I plan everything out for myself anyway. So my recipe is a full plan as to what I'm going to be doing that day, what I'm, how the beer is going to ferment, when, when, I, when I need this beer to be done so that I can either drink it, bottle it for competition, so I'm not late on any beers for having, <laughs> for having them ready for competition. Um, so it's more than just, here's my malts, here's my popping schedule, and that's it. Um, you know, I, I work out what the yeast is gonna be, maybe even try to figure out if I need like um, a yeast starter or anything like that. And then I, it might not be part of the actual recipe, but I, I also figure out like my water profile. And so there's, there's a lot, as long as I have it all written down, or at least planned, then I think I do a pretty good job with that. And I think that's the first place to start when, when thinking about recipes. It's a complete plan of what you're doing to try to make the beer you want to make. Um, so also, you know, based on uh, the next item here is, is really, it's easy to find recipes out there online or in books and sometimes that recipe isn't exactly what is going to work best for you. You need to make updates to that recipe based on your own equipment. Uh, you know, uh, for mashing efficiency, you probably need to change that, you know, fiddle with that number. A recipe is usually going to have a certain um, a mashing uh, number attached to that. And, that, and usually that, that might not be what you do. So I know that my equipment, I get like about a 72% mashing perf uh, efficiency. So I, I need a, a couple more ounces of malt than someone who does 75% or something like that. So you got to think about that as well. Um, and then also think that just because you made a recipe, it's not going to be the same the next time you go to make that. Your ingredients are going to change year to year uh, or from lot to lot when you get things. So it's, and it's not just alpha acids on hops or, um, you know, it's, it's how fresh your malt is and all kinds of things. So uh, there's a lot to think about. Uh, unfortunately, I'm sorry, there aren't many pictures in this. I couldn't really think of many things to do in, in it. And this is going to be pretty wordy. So I apologize as we're getting into this. So, so. So this, I, we're not talking about all this, but this is everything I write down about a recipe for myself, okay? So for, my, for a Saison I made like in November, this is all the stuff I, I, is part of my recipe, okay? So it's not just malts and hops and, and maybe a, a, a type of yeast, but it's, so basically, you know, I've got, I make a 10 gallon batch. These are my, you know, gravities are there. Um, the, the IBUs and the SRM, uh, also on top of this. So I use a lot of house malts because 
I've just been buying those myself mostly. Um, so mostly the Pilsner, so almost 60% of that, uh, almost 12% of the Smelt, and then some Vienna for color, um, some acidulated malt because that went in because of my water changes. I'd like to use acidulated malt with my Belgians and my Germans, uh, and I use lactic acid usually with my Americans and my English. Uh, I think I've talked about that in the water stuff. So I figured out all I needed for my additions for my water. You know, I went out and bought dis distilled water the day before so that I can uh, thin down the water from what we have. Or, um, you know, my whole mash schedule here. So I did a, I did a mash in at 120 because I was playing with spelt and then you know brought it up to 150 and then a mash out 165 you know figured out all my sparging stuff then i you know i've got my uh hop schedule which is pretty simple it's it's only a saison you know half an ounce at first words and then two ounces went into the whirlpool um there's a 90 minute boil um i had uh white labs has a uh, the yeast vault program. I don't know if many people know about it. It's kind of cool um, So they've got like different yeast uh, varieties that are only available through there and They will just grow up that yeast when enough people prepay for it uh, so there's uh, so there was a Saison uh, yeast that came out that was released through that that I bought up and um, I ended up having to get some more from Rick Seip, who had some in his house, because it took me like five months until I was ready to actually make this. So the Lewin Hook or whatever uh, Saison yeast I used for that. I also split this, and I've got a Brett version that's still sitting in secondary. So there's a lot there to think about for recipes. It's not just hey, here, here's my malts, here's my hops, and yeah, let's just go. Um, that's one way you can do it, uh, but I like to think about trying to plan all the little uh, machinations that, you, that I need to do. Um, so then on to guidelines. Um, we all know about the BJCB guidelines, or most of us do. Uh, that is just a, it's a way to try to uh, put apples to apples together when you're judging beers against the competition but it's also a good look place to look for as a reference as to what you want to put in into a recipe for a certain type of beer um, a lot of those styles that are in the beach acp guidelines or the ba guidelines which is uh, what uh, the pros get judged the gabf against there's also different guidelines that are used at the world beer cup that happens uh, every couple of years. But those guidelines are just, or more than just what I think um, uh, is just for that competition, they're, they're a good reference to use uh, when you're thinking about what you want to put in a recipe. Um, and then, so those styles that are in there, those, a lot of those have come because historically they were popular beers or came out of a pop, so uh, say American Pale Ale is really started with Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, okay, and which is, and there's a difference to a Sierra Nevada Pale Ale from what, say, um, Fuller's London Pride is, uh, which is an English pale. Uh, so, and, what, what do we think about with American Pale? It's, it's American-grown malts. Um, it's American-grown hops, especially like a Cascade hop, which is a much different flavor profile than what you would get from a East Kent Golding. Um, so that's what the differences are, and we can, we can see, hey, so if I want to make an American Pale Ale, I should put the Fuggles back on the shelf and grab the Centennials, right? Let's see. And then 
Um, other places to look for uh, for some of these guidelines, I guess, would be uh, the Brewers Publication books. Uh, Brewers Publications is the is a part of the BA slash AHA. Uh, they're the ones that are uh, publishing uh, like the malt book and the hops book, and they do have another series that are basically wrapped around styles. Um, so Mitch Steele's IPA book, I think, is the latest one that came out of that. Maybe the Sour book from Michael Tonsmeyer was another one. It might have been newer. But uh, those books are great because not only do they explain that style, like, forwards and back, there's a lot of recipes in there as well to start with. But reading up, it's especially if you want to, re to build up a recipe, um, it's close to historically a style can be, like an American IPA. Uh, you grab Mitch's book, you read through that, and you can gather enough information that then, yes, I know I'm gonna use pale malt and I'm not going to get too crazy on crystals. Um, I might use a little uh, simple sugar just to dry things out a little. And then, yes, I'm going to go crazy on these new hops that might not even have names yet, they're just, you know, so um, there's nothing wrong with just using that. Uh, so when it comes, I, I think what I'm trying to say at the end here is um, any minor differences from the guidelines to your recipe is probably fine, okay, as long as it comes out correctly. Uh, you don't have to stay within the guide. The guidelines are guidelines. They're not rules. Um, so I use a lot. I mean, I get a lot of information, and I think we, a lot of us do, from a lot of different sources. You've got the books we were talking about. Uh, I think uh, How to Brew from uh, John Palmer is a great place to start. Uh, not only for learning how to brew, but also for recipe formulation a little bit. Uh, Jamil and John's, Jamil Zanishev and John Palmer's book, um, Brewing Classic Styles, where Jamil went through the whole 2008 guidelines and said, here's a, here's a recipe that I've made before and that's metal. I mean, <laughs> you can't go wrong with that it's for, for a start. Now you've got a recipe, but just because you have that recipe doesn't necessarily mean you can get all the ingredients at the store right now, or um, yeah, or it's going to work exactly like you want to do now. Maybe some, maybe the styles moved a little bit, or you want to have something slightly different. But this is a place to start. So it's nice to have something there. You know, I mean. It's, don't think about all the only thing there is to recipe development is just copy and pasting, but start with something and just tweak. Uh, it's probably better than starting with a blank piece of paper. Uh, also, I, I just listed out podcasts and blogs that I you know, find things on. Uh, some of these are pretty cool uh, things to read, uh, especially uh, Shut Up About Barkley Perkins, uh, which is a this English guy that, I think he lives in Amsterdam or something, but like any geeky English guy, you know, he's writing about historical English beers and in the blog form. How long do you spend, Mike, when you're researching this? Uh, it depends. Uh, it depends, on, like, for certain styles, like my saisons, I kind of know what I'm doing, and I can just run off and do it. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's for something new, I might take some more time at it. Um, I think, for the most part, I've been making a lot of the same things. The Rauk beer here, that uh, that was the first time I did that, so I definitely went started with... Jamil's recipe, and then I looked for some other resources um, and read through those and tried to figure out what I could do. Uh, I actually talked to Larry Reuter, who's one who's meddled at uh, NHC nationally with that with his Rauk beer, 
and he's actually giving a talk on it uh, this year in Minnesota. So I talked to him about it. I actually went online. The AHA has a, a recipe list that you can get to, and they do publish the winners from NHCs on there. So they, they have Larry's published recipe. So I looked at re Larry's recipe. I caught a typo in it. I called him, I said, are you actually doing all this? And so there was like weird chocolate malts and things that weren't supposed to be in his rock beer <laughs> that I caught on the AHA site that no one else looked at, apparently but me. But um, yeah, I, I do spend some time at it and, I'll, and I think um, I'll, later I'll show you, uh, you know, I, I kind of calendar out how to make, while I'm making a recipe. I think, um, you know, I read up on things, and I, I'll, I'll draft something, I'll come back a couple days later and I'll review, review it and then make updates. I'll go shopping or buy stuff online and then I might have to change my recipe because I don't get, I don't have all the availability of all those ingredients that I thought I could do. And then I can make some updates and then maybe I need to make some other updates. So, um, I try to do it more iterative like that and for usually I'll, I'll look at a recipe I've made before and then I'll copy that and and then start ch making my changes from there. Over the course of a week or uh, Yeah, so I'll spend maybe an hour the first day or so on it and then I'll spend another couple of hours a couple days later and so uh, time wise over a month I might be spending uh, four hours on a recipe but it also helps to have a little bit of time there to break it up you don't want to just like just write I mean I can write the recipe in a few minutes but is it going to be exactly what I can do in the pot when it's time to brew or not based on ingredient availability or um, you know Maybe I woke up late and I don't have time to triple the cock something. So, uh, some other sources uh, to look at, uh, like I like I was saying, those. If you're an AHA member, the uh, uh, the last few conferences, last few years of conferences, the seminars are available to you. You can download the audio and the uh, presentations. So if there's, if somebody like Larry gives a talk on rock beer and you want to make one, and you're not going to the NHC this year, you can probably download it a month later and listen and, and go through the slides and get some information about rock beer like that. Um, you know, another good source, um, if you like a certain beer in a local brew pub or or you know a professional brewery drop a line to the to the brewer they probably are fine with giving you the recipe um most rec most professionals are, are cool with almost all their recipes going out to to home brewers like that and then um yeah i think that's that's some good places to start for resources Less words are even bigger on this one. Um, so uh, I like to use software to, to make up my recipe. Uh, you could do this in just like a spreadsheet software if you if you had the the calculations are there for anybody. Um, but um, I think I spend most of my time using Beersmith, and I think we'll play with that a little bit. Uh, Brewer's Friend is another one. I think Andrew. Or uh, which one did you use, Brewtoad? Brewtoad. Brew I think you guys use Brewtoad. Um, Brewer's Friend is another online one that's got some Brewer's cool Friend. tools. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. Um, it's free. Yeah. So there's a couple of online free ones that work pretty well. Uh, what I what I don't find in them that I have in Beersmith is the ability to like really tweak my uh, ingredients and keep those around for the next time I have them. Uh, so like when I get a bag from Andrew at House Malts, I can get the numbers from him and plug them into my software. 
so that I have them. Yes, yes. Yeah, Brewtoad might not have the best mashing tools, but I do use Brewtoad myself as like a scratch pad. So in between stuff at work, I might have that open in a, in a tab and just, hey, what if I did this? How would this work out? Um, also, uh, a lot of this soft, a lot of the software, I think Beersmith started it, but there's a, the, there's an XML uh, format um, that's very cool. Uh, the Beer XML is is out there. There's some open source products, I think, as well some free open uh, brewing tools that also use Beer XML. And it's a good way to cop to like send recipes back and forth between uh, brewers. If Andrew would use something like this, we could do it a lot easier. Instead of like just sending screenshots or whatever. Um, but Beer XML is a way to, I would, it's some formatting there where I, so I, I actually exported some things today and sent them to Andrew so that we'd have them here. So we've got some recipes and we've got some malt stuff that so that uh, I sent in. It's yeah, it's it's a it's a XML file format or or um, not file. Uh, I can't between applications. Yeah, it's 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 a way to send things between applications, and so it's a good way to get stuff back and forth between a couple of people. I think uh, actually our competition software. If we were actually trying to get recipes in there, you could upload your recipe yeah, via Beer XML. Um, but uh, another thing that I think I use outside of that software, and, and some of us do, is uh, water calculation spreadsheets. Uh, Brew and Water is the one that Andrew uses. I look at it and I just don't understand the rocket science there, but it happens. Um, easy water calculator is more my speed. It's uh, one screen and pretty simple to use for me. Um, I think we both do pretty well with our water, so I'm not worried about it. Uh, the one thing that's good about a recipe software is that it's easy to adjust the ingredient uh, uh, variables, whether it be hops with your alpha acids or with malt with your diastatic power or your um, your SRM numbers so that way you can dial in your colors and your bitterness um, and then also a lot of the software allows you to, to, to uh, choose a different uh, IBU calculator whether you want to be you know, old school and Rager, which is uh, Rager, is it's a linear uh, calculation of basically acid by time, um, and then Tinsith is kind of more of a inverse uh, square, but it's also uh, figures things out based on your uh, your gravity at the time. And it also brings in the the uh, the age of the hop, I think as well. Okay. But use a software for more than just coming up with your you know brew day stuff. Use it to plan out things uh, as well as record information about the beer, so that when you go back to it the next year, to like, all right, it's time to make my saison. It's spring, you know. Um, what did I do last year, and how did it work out? So, um, the one thing that you really need to think about when you're playing with software, though, uh, for this stuff is to try to dial in your own brew equipment uh, to the software. The software comes with a, you know, it's set at a, at a generic thing. Um, that might not be exactly what you're doing. So, uh, like I said, uh, mash efficiency might be set at 75. So I brought that down to 72, and I also um, you almost want to start thinking about your uh, the weight of things. I think there's uh, 
can't think of what it's called right now, but um, w when you're playing with your mash tun, depending on the type of mash tun and the weight of it, uh, they can calculate the differences, the thermal mass of your mash tun, so you can fig so you can dial in. Okay, I need to get my strike water at 165 to get a 152 degree, degree mash. Uh, once I've mixed in my grains that are at 65 degrees, right? So there's, if you have that stuff dialed in about your equipment, the software comes, becomes easier to work with. And you can then predictably get the results you were expecting. So first thing that I'm, I'm trying to say here uh, is Especially for you, for like uh, the more exp the, maybe the inexperienced brewer, uh, when you're thinking about malt, there's really two major types of malt. You have your base malts, which make uh, sugars that can be eaten by a yeast to, to make alcohol, and you've got specialty malts that are there to add colors and flavors um, that the base malts can't do. Uh, that's the big thing there. Um, yeah. And then also uh, malt extract uh, is basically what you would replace your base malt with if you were doing or the other way around uh, for an extract batch. And there's a calculation out there for figuring out if you wanted to take a, your recipe that you made as an extract batch into an all grain and back. So there are ways to do that. Um, and then the other thing is thinking about when you're thinking about base malts versus your specialty malts. Um, I try to, to, I think the number that I try to shoot for usually is, is at least 80% base malt. Um, the reason you want to do that, yes? Dry malt extract versus uh, malt, malt syrups? Yeah. Do you prefer, have preference for who's brewing? Um, I think it's just, they're both about the same. It's just, uh, I think dry malt is easier to keep fresh longer. Um, and, but liquid is just fine. Uh, most, the thing is that liquid takes more weight and maybe work harder to work with sometimes. However, dry malt, when I, I used to mix that in, you know, it just foam up everywhere too. Yeah, so it's one mess or another. Um, it, I think it really depends on the brewer as to what you feel more comfortable with when it comes to dry or liquid extract. Um, the other, the other thing with malts or grains is uh, we don't have to just use barley. You know, a lot of us use wheat. Some of us use spelt, rye. Um, there are other things out there. There's the so those things you got to think about how I want to add that and if I want to do like and depending on style, you might want to try like you know like our uh, wheat wine. You might want to use 65% wheat in. Whereas maybe in a IPA you might want to just use, you know, two three uh, percent just to add some more uh, head retention. Um, where else are we going with this? Sorry, I'm. Yes. Oh yes, uh, malt origin. So. When I'm making a recipe, I usually make a recipe towards a style. I think that you should be making your beer with ingredients that are from where that style originated. So if I'm making an English IPA or an uh, English version of an oatmeal stout, I want to try to, to use English malts and English hops um, to, to make that, and an English ale yeast. If I was making a, an American IPA, I would do more of a cleaner American barley that's two-row. I would just, you know, very little, 
I wouldn't run, you know, grab like uh, Mutton's Crystal 40 to throw in there. I would, if I did something like that, it would probably be a Breeze or or something else. So, uh, and then also think about uh, when it comes to origin, and I was Molster is different. Um, I think if we go back up. Uh, not all, not all, say, pale malt is the same, and that's that differs greatly by region, but it also differs by maltster, okay. And the, and then the maltster may have different varieties of the same of pale ale, malt or pale malt or two row. Um, so you got to really think, okay, if I'm going to be using one or the other. And uh, I know Tim has a uh, usually goes on a rant about chocolate malt, um, and we can let him do that. There, chocolate malt is just a type of roasted malt, but there are so many. Like Breeze is different from Muttons is different, and Muttons is different from Thomas Fawcett, and, and Thomas Fawcett has another one that's the pale version. So. And it's more than what it tastes like, but it's also the lava bond that's different. Uh, so when you go to create a recipe, don't just, from the list, just grab chocolate malt, but make sure you're grabbing that maltster and then maybe even that actual chocolate malt, if you can find that information. Um, that's what you need to worry about when, when you're coming up with a recipe. Uh, because if you just think, okay, all chocolate malt's going to be 500 love a bond, and then you get a mutton in and it's 650, well, why is my, you know, and I just want to put a little bit into my Irish red, why is it brown now? So, uh, any other questions about malt? Probably not. Uh, hops wise, uh, basically, first thing, the, the one big thing you need to know about hops uh, is that alpha acids isomerize uh, in heated water over time, so there are calculations for that. Um, also, what we're getting, there's more kind of talk about hop oils over, say, I, the alpha acids and the beta acids. So. Um, you got to think about how you want to maybe try to preserve your 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 uh, hop oils. I know uh, we've got a few good IPA brewers here that that know how to to um, dry hop the, the way or or use very late hoppings that uh, try to preserve a lot of those oils for um, for good results. Um, and then it's you know your flavors in your hop variety. Or, or easily, or yep, yeah, there are varieties out there for hops. They have a certain hop variety has a certain flavor profile. However, even by variety, you're not always getting the same citra every time you go to the store or buy it online. Um, you're going by lot. Things can be different on a hop and. So it almost makes sense that if you have some in stock in, in home, maybe you have a little extra, make yourself a hop tea or something like that and try to figure out, hey, is this giving me the flavors I wanted out of it? Oh, or do I need to, do I, should I increase this? Or should I maybe blend this with something else um, to try to get your flavors the way you want? Um, unfortunately, I haven't been making many IPAs recently there's a lot of good ones around, um, so I, I don't play around with hops as much as I used to. But I don't know if Jim or uh, Steve, if you guys do anything like that, or just go ah oh, variety, slam it in there. Yeah, the, yeah, the, finding the, the the freshest or. The, and you gotta smell them too. Mm -hmm. you, yeah. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So, s at least smell your hops before you, as you're making up your recipes. Like the day before, or are you talking about like... switch on the fly sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like, if we have citrus, it smells like cheese and, and 
diesel or something, and it, it, it just, I don't know if it's going to work out. We'll switch it to Amarillo or something and smell yeah, that. So Sometimes it's on flight, I mean, when you're opening, because we don't usually open Just because you have your recipe figured out, and this is what you're going to do, but then when you open up the bag of hops the day, during brew day, you might have to change things up on the fly because they smell cheesy and diesel or... And, and speaking of, you, yeah. recalculate, you recalculate your recipe based on alphas because of the different alpha hops. Yeah. So it's one of those you're just tweaking as you brew. Yeah. But so, you can still use those for the bittering, though. You, you could. You, you could still use things, that for the bittering, but you might as well just... I mean, you're saving yourself a few bucks, but is it is it worthwhile in the end? I mean, you're trying to make the beer you want to make. Uh, other things to think about in your water, uh, your sulfite to chloride ratio, that, that affects how that beer tastes, malty to, to a hoppy. Uh, your water, whether it's soft or hard, and then I don't want to get too much into alkalinity. I was going to... I was going to let Kara do that soon. <laughs> Don't mention water to Kara. Yeah, do not ask Kara about water alkalinity right now. She might punch you. Um, Yeast-wise, uh, you know, there used to be a big... Uh, discrepancy between liquid and dry I don't think that's really the case anymore uh, the dry seems to be a much better product than it used to be and there are more uh, variety wise it's still easier to find more varieties liquid but there are a lot of dry varieties that are coming out so a lot I it, it really depends on what you're comfortable with uh, using I think um, what else we so you also want to make sure, as I was saying earlier with the malts, you want to use a strain of yeast uh, that is supposed to be for that style. Um, you're not going to use American Ale and with 50% uh, wheat beer and call it a Hefeweizen. You're going to use a Hefeweizen yeast. And the same thing with, you're not you can make an American IPA with English ale yeast, but I think you're going to do better if you make an American IPA with American ale yeast. What about mixing yeast? Uh, well, with mixing yeast, it it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, you can do that. There's, I mean, what what are you thinking? Like, as a as a mixed fermentation sour, or are you thinking more like a blend of American and English? Might be. Well, I made a Weizenbach and I used yeah. like half Hefe yeast, but then I cultured some like beard bear yeast. Yeah. And like, you know, let's see how that Weizenbach will turn out. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I do a lot of that myself. Uh, because I make 10 gallon batches, I do a lot of splits and yeast is, or. Exactly. Or microfauna are. As it's so, I do a lot of like mixed culture on one, and the other one is going to be so. My half of Eisen, half of it is usually becomes a sour mm. that's a Brett and lactic uh, <laughs> bacteria. Hmm? Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know. I do know that people have problems sometimes with, say, the DuPont Saison strain and will use something else to try to finish it off, and that's fine. Um, I kind of do the opposite. You know, uh, same thing. So there's so many ways to think about it, but what you got to do is think about it beforehand and then plan it and put it into your recipe. Um, and then other things, uh, availability is a big issue with recipes. You, know, you grab a recipe from a, from a book or online, you're not gonna, you might not be able to find the same res, uh, ingredients out there. If you, especially if you're going to the same homebrew shop, you know, they're buying what they can get and what they feel they're, they're help, can't, handling most beers with. Um, but ask the, the local guy if he'll 
special order you something if you want to use that, but then know that it's going to take you time to get it in. Um, I was, I made a Hefeweizen recently for uh, Wizard of Saz. I was going, and the last time I did this, I also did my uh, Brett and, and PDO uh, on the other half of it. And I ordered that stuff, and it came in last week. And I wanted it a month ago. So uh, I had to use something else. So that, but I had to mix it up. So I actually, I ended up getting I, what, a different Brett strain they, they got for me incorrectly. And I didn't realize that. Because I didn't open the bag that I got until I got home. Or I actually had the brew day and went, huh, this is... Uh, this is Brett Brooks Vry and not uh, my the one I wanted. So I'm that beer's turning into something different, but I'm playing. With, I'm running it with the, on the fly, so I'm not too worried about that. Um, but some of your 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 thoughts about recipe is what can I get locally when I go to the store? What do I have to go order? online if, if I can't find it there and and really worry about what you I mean you, what you can find there or what you can get to, to for yourself uh, for brew day so worry about availability when you're making your recipe and then another thing is uh, personally we all have different homebrew systems Right? We all have a different way we make our beer. It's, there's all these little differences between what I do and what Jim does, or Andrew and, and Steve. So um, that should play into your recipe. Um, or what, I, what you prefer to do. I would rather just throw in, usually, uh, some uh, melanoidin malt then spend a couple of hours mashing like Andrew would. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with decoctions. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with them. Uh, so here's kind of a kind of a just a drop of say a calendar of so I'll draft my recipe on one on, on say a Monday and then I'll go back to it on a Wednesday and, and look it over and and tweak as, as what I got. And then say Friday I make, I, I go to the homebrew shop and I, 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 I go my ingredients and I gotta, and maybe there are some differences and then I gotta go online and I go online on Saturday so I'll have that. And, and so on Sunday, I'll make my updates to the recipe again because of what I've ordered. Um, and then, uh, I gotta transfer the last beer out of the carboy so I can use that, clean it, make sure my carboys are clean before brew day, right? And then I gotta go get my propane. I gotta run to the store and get distilled water, things like that. Make sure the brew house is ready to be used. So prep that up, have my brew day. And then primary fer fermentations is almost like two weeks worth. Make sure I, I, I think about having enough time to do a diacyl rest, some time to chill it down. The only thing is to, to think about this is give yourself what I would call in project management some slack time. You know, maybe there's something else going on. You gotta go, yeah. So give yourself a few days here and there where, okay, this is my plan of when I'm gonna have things done, but give yourself a few more days in there to maybe the yeast isn't working as hard, as fast as you thought it would, or maybe you have a snobs night out to go to and you can't be home transferring. You know, there, there's other things that are happening. Priorities. You got to have your priorities. Yeah, yeah. Maybe your ingredients don't show up on time. Uh, also. Folks. <coughs> Can't quite hear Mike yeah. up here. Quick question on your yeast. I mean, how many days before your brew day do you, do you use a yeast starter? Do you uh, I will use a yeast starter if I'm using a yeast. So most of the time when I brew, uh, I get yeast from a local brewery, and I just 
you, I plop and go. Um, if I'm making something with a special type of yeast, uh, I will grow it up to make sure I have enough. So really with a starter, you need to just make that the next, the day before. 24 hours? I, yeah, yeah, less than that. You, you need less than 24 hours. Six? No, I don't think you need 24 hours. Can you do it too long? Yeah, yeah, no more. Can you do it too long? Yes, you can. Because at that point, then the yeast starts to drop out of suspension because they don't have anything else to eat. They're like, we're bored. Yeah, yeah, just pitching a high croissant, which is probably eight hours after, six to eight hours after your, so you could do a yeast starter and then go to bed and then the next morning wake up and start your brew day. Um, I usually do it, you know, that evening, but yeah, I, I wouldn't, I'm usually, it's 12 to 16 hours, I would say, between pitching into the starter and when I pitch that starter into the... you get more the, for the dry yeast? Uh, the dry yeast you don't necessarily need to make a starter for. Uh, you do get more cells in the dry yeast packet than you would in a, in a pitchable uh, wet pack. Um, so it's, and it's usually about double. So if you hydrate your dry yeast correctly, you should be good to go. And so you put that into your warm water to hydrate, and then 20 minutes later, it's ready to go in there. Um, it, no, it doesn't necessarily kick off as quickly, but you do start off with enough viable yeast if you, if you work out the calculation of, okay, I'm going to be around this for my gravity, so this is what I need to do um, that, that's another thing to think about in your recipe uh, for yeast is, okay, I'm going to, my recipe is for this gravity, I need to make sure, and there are calculators out there, to say I need X number of cells per liter, so I'm going to need this much into my starter, or I'm going to have to buy extra vials, um, and, th and that's what I do. I do a lot of mixed fermentation stuff, mm -hmm. so I buy more vials. I can't really make starters out of those. Uh, overall, and we're getting close to the end of this, in other words. Um, yeah, thanks. I'm just. Andrew would have been up here all day or all night himself <laughs> if I didn't say, oh, I can do this. Um, so remember the beer styles grew out of successful beers and you know styles basically came out of certain regions um, so for a given recipe when you're trying to make a certain style go get those ingredients make that recipe from ingredients that come from that region okay so if I want to make an English ESB I'm not going to make it with Brees or malt, you know, I'm not going to use American malts and New Zealand hops. However, uh, you could do that kind of because when it comes to an English ESB, they're cool with you, with, you know, the English brewers are making their beers with, um, with ingredients from across the world. But if you put it into a competition, Greg's going to say, no, this is what we should have been using. Um, don't try to reinvent the wheel when it comes to a recipe. Don't just start from a blank piece of paper. Um, you know, there are examples out there. Start with a, a known good example and then tweak that for what's available, what you want to play with, and go from there. Don't um, yeah, just don't try that. It doesn't work out. Um, so yeah, follow your proven recipes, um, and then uh, don't don't just go for the dusty older books in our library, but maybe some of the newer ones. Uh, there's been a lot of advances in zymergy or brewing science as of late, um, so. Finding, 
finding a recipe from Charlie Papazian's first version of his book is probably not going to be as good as grabbing an IPA recipe from Mitch Steele's book right now. And then when it comes to your recipe, don't just, don't expect, okay, I've, I've wrote this recipe and this is what I'm gonna do the next time out with the same kind of beer. Um, it shouldn't be set in stone. Take in uh, any feedback you've got, make tweaks for that. Also, you might not be able to get the same ingredients again, so you're gonna have to tweak for that as well. And then this is, I think this is the final slide. Um, like, a, have your overall plan for more than just, here's, here's what the malts are and the, and the hops are that I'm gonna use, but think out, okay, I'm going to need this much time to have this beer ready so that I could have it at so-and-so's party or I could have it at a competition. And also think about, okay, I'm going to make sure I'm gonna have enough time to let this ferment correctly and then I'm going to need to do this and that to make sure it's ready for a bottle. Um, so figure that all out and say, okay, not, that means I'm going to have to brew by this day uh, to have all that. So I think that should be part of your plan. You know, it's a big plan. It's not just those few things. Uh, when it comes to your ingredients, uh, try to simplify it. Um, any recipe with more than like six malts is usually not a good idea. Um, you, you can make a recipe with like say one or two to three base malts, but um, you might be doing too much there. Uh, it, my double IPA was a, was a blend of regular pale and uh, Maris Otter or something else. That's fine. But then, you know, and the same thing with so, yes, there, there are all these great malts out there. You don't have to put every one of them in your recipe in the same time. Uh, yes, exactly. So for especially malts, and also like for, say, a porter, you're going to have a medium crystal. You're going to have... A, a chocolate, and then you probably need something else to yes, yet darken it up, say like uh, midnight wheat or something like that. Um, and then also, yeah, it's great to have seven hops in my beer, but maybe not. It depends. I mean, some somebody you can sometimes get away with that, but. It might be, make more sense just to blend in a few hops for your IPA than doing all of them. Um, and then also when you when you make your recipe, give yourself some time to review it. Don't just like put, make it up on the back of a napkin on Friday night and then expect to brew Saturday morning. Uh, write it down, look it over. Give yourself some some time in between reviews. Uh, that's it's better than just trying to do one cram session and, and get your recipe done. Uh, 